and gifts of visualization. It's my pleasure to introduce Chris, but first I just want to take a moment to talk about the um, Digital Library Seminar and the Digital Humanities co-sponsored events. That's, um, this is one of several we do in the fall and the spring, and we're working together. The Digital Library Seminar has traditionally been for folks here in the Columbia University Libraries, and the Digital Humanities Center sponsored talks have been um, available to raise awareness around some of the issues in the digital humanities. So thank you for, for being here. Um, we are, it's our pleasure to have uh, Chris Allen Sula here. He's an assistant professor at the School of Information and Library Science at Pratt. And he coordinates digital humanities there as well. He has his PhD in philosophy from New City University of New York and a certificate in international, uh, interactive technology and technology. As you'll see today, his research is wide ranging. It focuses on network studies and intellectual and social movements, as well as digital humanities and information transition. So, with that, I'll see you Chris, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks to all of you for coming. Can all of you hear me fine, hopefully? Um, thanks. I hope that this is an interesting talk for all of you, if not a thought-provoking one. And I'm going to start off with sort of a rogues gallery of some questionable or some bad visualizations as sort of an entry into this topic. Uh, so I'll start with this one, um, which comes from the Committee for a Responsible uh, Federal Budget, which is a nonpartisan think tank in Washington. This is, on a very timely topic, the fiscal cliff. Um, and this is... Uh, really showing two sort of alternative plans for how this all can go. Um, one plan could be um, raising taxes, having cuts to a lot of federal programs, and then we sort of slide down the cliff um, to, to low levels of national debt. Um, or we can pretty much maintain um, a current course or a projected course, and then we have this sort of mountain of debt. Um, if you look at how this is titled also, the mountain doesn't look such like a mountain, more like a little hill from where we are now. And, um, but this is certainly how the debate is being framed publicly. Um, and this visualization, I think, captures a lot of, of what's going on there. Um, these kind of visualizations are not new by any stretch of the imagination. Here's an example from 1801 by William Playfair. He was really one of the first to develop bar charts, or at least popularize them. And this is a graph showing uh, the red line there is weekly wages of a good mechanic, and um, the black or the grayish lines are the average price of wheat. And this is data from uh, 1565 to 1821. Now, a few things to notice about this. First, he's publishing this in 1801, and he's got data through 1821, um, which is its own issue. Um, also, he has this quote in his report here where he says, "Never was wheat so cheap in proportion to mechanical labor as it is at the present time." But I'm not sure that the visualization remotely supports this. If you look at what's happening sort of at the end of the chart here, the price of wheat is, no, is at the, its largest difference from the wages compared to the overall trend. And when you get uh, sort of the impression of this at the whole, you see more of the fluctuation of prices rather than this sort of steady story that we're on a, a track of progress and now um, wheat is extremely cheap. There are plenty of other historical examples um, of the use of visualization for political purposes. Uh, this is an example from um, the German popular press in 1933. This is the Iron Ring around Germany. Um, so this is designed to show um, the borders of Germany and the troops in neighboring countries uh, that have forces um, that could be marshaled against Germany. And of course, it was used in the pop popular press to argue for rearmatization of Germany and a buildup of forces. And if you were to take this map probably six years later, it would be the exact opposite um, in terms of who had which forces and where they were. A similar one to this, which you might recognize, is from 2002, the CIA report on Iraq's uh, weapons of mass destruction programs. Um, and this is a map showing um, alleged ballistic missiles there and showing the range of those ballistic missiles and the alleged threat to um, Iraq's neighbors in terms of uh, missile range. Now, I don't want to give the impression that all of visualizations are used for sort of um, rhetorical or, or, or dubious purposes. Um, there are plenty other good examples of this in history. Um, here's a map from 1854 by John Snow. This is of a cholera outbreak in Leeds. Um, and what he did was to map uh, the residences where people live. And those are those black dots there, the darker ones. Um, those are people who have come down with cholera. And by mapping it, he was able to see that I don't know if you can see, there's sort of a center spot there where uh, the, the outbreaks are clustered. 
And he was able to show that there was actually a water pump there that was contaminated, and that was the source of the cholera outbreak. So by mapping it, he was able to sort of diagnose the source of this and then use it in a public policy sense to just seal the well, and the cholera outbreak was contained. Um, here's one more example of um, a use of visualization maybe for interesting or better purposes. Um, this is the Electoral College results from the past year. And you all know this map, and you all know a story about red and blue states that's very common in the media. Here's a very different map um, of very similar data from Robert Vanderbee called Purple America. Um, what you're looking at here are all of the congressional districts in the country, and they're colored, this is a chloropleth map, um, they're colored by the proportion of Democratic blue or Republican red votes in that county, or in that congressional district. Um, and what you see if you sort of switch back and forth quickly between these maps is a very different story about sort of division in the country, the polarization of the country. Um, and many districts here wind up being purple, meaning that they're more moderate between the two parties in terms of votes. Um, you also see some pockets of maybe blue in places you don't expect or some pockets of red in places you don't expect too. So this is a much more complex and I think a much more nuanced story than what you get from this map. But this map is certainly the one that you're most used to seeing and the one that you're most familiar with and the narrative that gets sort of spun out uh, in media. So at this point, I think we sort of want to reflect and say, what's going on with visualization here? What's it being used for? Um, and there's this interesting quote by Vin Scully, who is a sportscaster for the Dodgers. He says, statistics are, used not, uh, so, are used, much used like a drunk uses a lamppost for support, not for illumination. Um, I don't take such a dim view of the role of visualization or statistics here. Um, I think that there can be good uses of them and it can be used um, for support and justifiable support. So I think the question really of this project um, that, I'm, that I'm engaging here is how do we sort those uses? How do we find um, the, the good or the progressive uses of visualization and how do we have a framework to critique or to at least understand um, the other uses of visualization. So if we jump into sort of what the value of visualization is, this has been discussed mainly in the sort of information science literature as cognitive enhancement. So there are many features of visualization that actually increase our ability to process information. Um, one of them is increased memory. So you can look, for example, at a million data points at once. You don't have to hold all of them in working memory. You can just look at a graph and see them all there all at once. Um, or if you think also about sort of a, even a Google map where you kind of zoom in and zoom out. When you zoom in, you don't have to worry about remembering all the peripheral information in the map because it's still there for you when you want to consult it again later. You can focus on one particular element and the map preserves the memory uh, of the rest of it that you can zoom out and see again. Visualizations can also reduce search time. If you want to know the highest or the lowest sort of value, you can scan it at a glance and find, and find that um, information. They can enhance pattern recognition. You can see clustering. You can see rising or falling trends quite clearly. And you can see them much more easily with a visual interface than you can see if you were to look at a table of data. Imagine looking at pages and pages and pages of numbers and then trying to extract a pattern from that. Or if I show you a graph, you can see clustering in an instant. Um, speaking of the instance, um, or the, the instant recognition of things, uh, visualization also enables perceptual inference. Most of the, the real information that you get from a visualization is processed in the first quarter of a second in which you see it. This is called pre-attentive processing, and it concerns very basic things like boundary discrimination, size, shape, color boundaries, and this is really what most visualizations or most data visualizations make use of. Uh, those perceptual inferences are extremely quick, again, a quarter of a second, and they happen before uh, the information even gets to sort of the higher brain and the, the logical functions of the brain. So there's a sense in which visualization can uh, lead to very rapid information processing, much more than if you were to read verbal text or read over data. If you have something like a dashboard where you're monitoring things live, uh, you can monitor those figures using just perceptual attention. You don't have to like continually scare, stare at the screen. If there's some subtle changes or even dramatic changes in the visualization, your perceptual mechanisms will pick it up. Your eye tracking um, functions will pick it up quite automatically. Um, and another big value of visualization is once you have this data that's coded and ready for a visualization, you have it in a manipulable form. It's not locked in a book or locked in a 
print report anymore. It's now digital, it can be uh, reformed, it can be retooled in various ways, and often it can be revisualized in many different ways. So these are what um, the leading researchers talk about as the cognitive enhancements um, or the cognitive benefits of visualization. There's maybe some more general things to say, um, and that comes from the insight that we get from visualization. So back in 2007, before, I think there were some examples of visualization there, but it wasn't quite as prominent as it is today. Business Week um, had an interview um, with an IBM researcher. IBM, by the way, produces a software called Many Eyes, which is public visualization software. Some of you might be familiar with that. Um, I don't know if Mark, Martin Wattenberg worked on that, but he's certainly in the culture there of IBM and, and using data visualization. Um, he says, I see it now, aha, exclaims IBM researcher Martin Wattenberg. Um, and he's describing how he believes a layperson should ideally react um, to data visualizations like a world map or an up-to-the-minute um, information on population data or a bubble chart. The idea here is that you should get it in a flash and it should be an aha moment of insight. Now I understand something. A very different way of saying this um, is Catherine Poisson's view um, that sometimes information visualization uh, can uh, answer questions that you didn't know you had. You may not know much about a subject or you may not know a particular aspect of a subject when you enter into a visualization, but once you see it, you may develop new questions or you may have answers to questions you didn't even think of before because you have new insight from it, you have novel insight. There's also uh, visualization discussed in an artistic way, um, and here's a very interesting sort of schematic um, from people who are working on information aesthetics. And you see information visualization in one corner, but there are other kinds of visualization. There's um, visualization art, there's informative art, there's infographics, there's all this kind of um, different uses of, of graphical display of information floating around. And I think there's a, this hasn't been much discussed, but there's an interesting element because Aesthetics and art usually draws on emotional capacities as well. And that's very interesting to think about when you're looking at data. You're not just sort of reasoning through it or thinking about it logically, but you're also getting emotional, uh, some kind of emotional reaction or an emotional reception from it. And that might actually be what's giving you that insight or what's adding to the insight is that it has some punch, it means something more than just here's a, a, you know, a stale body of information. It has a certain impact, the use of color, the use of shape, the use of position all create a certain feel to a visualization, and that too can add to the information broadly construed that you get from it. There's one other domain in which I think this, the importance of visualization has really been stressed, and that's in journalism. Um, so there's a, a nice quote from Jeff McGee, who is a Knight Journalism Fellow at Stanford, working on this, um, and he says, journalists are coping with rising, the rising information flood by borrowing visualization techniques from other fields. Some newsrooms are already beginning to retool their staffs and systems to prepare for a future in which data becomes a medium. Not that, that's not that data accompanies text, it's the data itself is a medium. The data becomes something like video or audio or text. It becomes a way of understanding information, it becomes a new literacy for communicating that information to new audiences. And certainly uh, the popular press and, and journalists have been among the leaders here. Um, most of you are probably familiar with visualization from reading things like the New York Times or Newsweek or, or other popular press materials that include these now interactive visualizations. How many instances of the New York Times recently has been a you know, big live visualization on the front that you can even interact with or play with or add your feedback or add your comment to? So many sort of leading journalists in the field see this as the way that the field is going. Um, and there's, there's no end to this, and it's not that visualization is an accompaniment or a side note to what's happening, it's that it's becoming a main note or a main way of, of presenting information itself. So given that there's an interest in visualization in all of these domains, what have people said about the ethics of visualization? Uh, not very much, uh, but there are a few examples. Um, one comes from Jason Moore, who put forward what he calls a Hippocratic Oath for visualizers. Um, and this goes as follows, he says, I shall not use visualization to intentionally hide or confuse the truth which is intended to portray. I will respect the great power visualization has in garnering wisdom and misleading the uninformed. I accept this responsibility willfully and without reservation and promise to defend this oath against all enemies, both domestic and foreign. This is pretty shocking coming from the U US Air Force Research Laboratory. Um, but it's actually not that shocking also if you think about what the Hippocratic Oath is sort of coming from. It comes from a long history of medical ethics. And the Hippocratic Oath generally says do no harm. 
But I think if you ask a medical ethicist, what's the significance of that? It's certainly a necessary principle in medical ethics, but it doesn't go very far. To just say that doctors should not harm anyone uh, doesn't say much what about what they should do or how they could help people or how they could advance humanity through their practice. So I think that this is a good start at sort of a, a bare bones ethics of visualization. But the real question here is what more can we say? What more can we say about the way that visualization can um, bring information to new audiences, the way it could uh, expose information that isn't usually discussed. Um, and I think we'll have to go a little bit beyond this sort of just negative liberty or do no harm view um, to really give that answer. There's another example given by Manuel Lima, who's the author of a book you might know, Visual Complexity. Um, and in a, his Information Visualization Manifesto, uh, he gives a number of principles there, which some people regard as something like an ethics for visualization. So he has things like um, start with a question, um, don't glorify aesthetics, aspire for knowledge, look for relevancy. Uh, but these two are quite general. Um, and frankly, I think most of them you'll see are more concerned with design than they are with how visualization is used or the context in which it is used. And when you read the Information Visualization Manifesto, what he's really trying to do is to distinguish what we might call data visualization or visualization that has a, a hard empirical basis, something to back itself up against in fact, as opposed to just information art or information graphics, which can kind of be much softer and not always based in, in, in fact as much. And he's really trying to guard against these kind of things, um, like a periodic table of something um, or uh, a tube map of something or, or th these common infographics that you see that they're recycled forms um, and they're cute, but they might not convey as much information, and they really don't have um, the, the visual display optimized to the information that, that they are showing. I think there is one person who would have written a book on the ethics of information, and it's Daryl Huff. Um, he has a book which some of you might have heard of called How to Lie with Statistics. It's from 1954. And in the beginning of that book, he says, there's a secret language of statistics that's so appealing to a fact-minded culture, um, and it's employed to sensationalize, to inflate, to confuse, and to oversimplify. And he warns that the crooks already knows these tricks, and honest men must learn them in self-defense. So part of what he's trying to do with his book is to raise awareness of the way in which statistics can be manipulated. Um, so that the sort of average citizen can look at statistics critically and not be misled by them. So as he goes through his book, he talks, again, it's mainly about statistics, not visualization. So he talks about things like sample bias, choosing a sample that's too low or too narrow or specially chosen and gets you results that aren't representative. He talks about margins of error and how measurements can often have a large margin of error, um, but that is often papered over and it's presented as fact. He talks about post hoc explanations where you make the data say whatever you want and then you give an explanation that supports that. And he has a very interesting chapter there on what he calls G-Wiz graphics. Uh, G-Wiz graphics for him are really cases where it's too easy, right? The, you get a visualization that, that shows exactly what you want, but you don't get that for free. Um, you can, it, it's not simply that, that easy. And there's an example here. This is the um, government payroll from 1937. It is the exact same data. The only thing that's been changed is the scale. So if we start with the one on the right, the scale there goes from zero to $30 million and it shows a trend of stability, right? Government payrolls are stable. They're not going up that much by the end of the year. The one on the left is the same data, except the scale is from about um, 18.5 million to 20.5 million. And when you show that same data in just that very narrow band, suddenly the trend gets magnified very much, and it looks like government payrolls are up. It's on the rise, right? Overspending. So he's worried about, and, and this, this scale difference is the main example he comes back to again and again and again through the book. Um, so he's very interested in how you can have the same data tell a very different story depending on how you design the, the visualization of it. But he doesn't say more about other types of this. And even at this point in 54, we have visualization, we have charts, and we have those things, but not nearly the kinds and the varieties that we have today. So I think he's, he's sort of prescient about the need to recognize this problem, but he doesn't have uh, much more to contribute to the discussion beyond that. Now, <clears throat> on the academic side of things, what has been said? Um, almost nothing. Um, almost nothing. So much of the research into information visualization in information science is strictly about new algorithms for drawing visualization 
or understanding um, how the visualizations interact with human observers and how it adds value to their experience. But value there is things like, again, cognitive benefits or some kind of task performance. Um, it's not value in the ethical sense or, or the political sense of, of the term. I think there is one window into this, and that comes from the philosophy of information, uh, which is an area that Luciano Floridi has really developed and, and made a, a recognizable field in the past five to seven years. And in his book, he has this sort of longish quote where he talks about information and computer communication technologies. And he asks, why do these raise moral issues? And can what he calls computer ethics amount to a coherent and a cohesive discipline rather than just sort of a random collection of, of problems and questions um, and practical solutions? And he says, if you can have a systematic account of computer ethics, what is its conceptual rationale? How does it compare to other applied ethics in other domains? Are the issues in computer ethics unique in the sense that you have to investigate them on their own? Or can you just apply other ethical theories that are out there in a more derivative way to computer ethics? What kind of ethics is computer ethics? What justifies a certain methodology, like reasoning by analogy, or by using case-based analysis to give ethical um, insight? What's the contribution of computer ethics back to ethical discourse in general? Sometimes we have applied ethics and we apply general theories to specific cases, but sometimes we also get insights back the other direction. The cases help us to refine general principles or call into question those principles because they don't apply in enough cases. And then he has a, you know, he raises these wonderful questions and then he simply says, in the following chapters I shall not address or even come close to any of these issues, they really require a different book. And the rest of his book goes into the logic and the semantics of information. So I think he's very aware of this challenge and he's aware of the need for this kind of ethical investigation, but he himself is not, at least at this point, interested in giving it. It's got to be given somewhere else. So in terms of sort of where, do, where could we go for a systematic account of this? Where could we go to understand what a, an ethics of visualization would look like? Um, I was thinking through what are the, what's the groundwork of this? What are candidates where we might um, start looking for a way to give a systematic account, not a case by case by case account of what's wrong with this visualization or what's going on here or there, but a more general answer to the question, uh, what are the ethical stakes in visualization? How do we cre have a critique of visualization? How do we give recommendations for what to do with visualization to practitioners? So as I started thinking about this, uh, three candidates came to mind. Uh, one is speech act theory. One is role-based or professional ethics morality. And one is just sort of a general ethical framework that you would then apply to this domain. Um, so no big surprises here. Um, uh, I'm going to go through all three of them. I don't think the first two work as a, as a systematic foundation, and I'll explain why. I think we'll have to find something in, in the third route. But I do think that in moving through the first two, we find some interesting things about visualization that can inform an ethics. So that's why I think it's, it's not just an academic exercise to work through, it actually is informative for our, our overall account. So to sort of warm us up for speech act theory, um, let's think a little bit about visualization as just an act of communication. Um, I always stress this in teaching visualization, that really what you're doing is communicating. And when you're doing a visualization of something, it's not so different than writing. Um, you have a narrative to it. You have a common focus or a central claim that you want to get across. And concepts like word choice or tone can very easily be translated into concepts like design or color choice or the way that a particular piece of information gets represented in a visual display. So I think there are some deeper analogies between visualization and communication or, or written communication. And surprisingly, Foucault has something to say about this. Um, he has this little passage in the Archaeology of Knowledge where he says, a graph, a growth curve, an age pyramid, a distribution cloud are all statements. Any sentences that accompany them are just interpretation or commentary. They are in no way equivalent to what we would say the visualization itself. This is proved by the fact that in a great many cases, only an infinite number or nearly infinite number of sentences could equal all the elements that are represented in the visualization. Uh, so I went on Google Ngram and I asked, uh, I put in Foucault and I wanted to see the rise of, of Foucault literature in books, in English language books. Um, and here's what it looks like between 1940 and 2000. But if you think about what this represents, we're looking at tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of books with this one statement, this one visual statement. And this is what he means. If we, uh, anything else I have to say about this is really an interpretation of this graph. I could talk about why, 
why his interest peaks at a certain point, or why it wanes apparently during the late 90s, but then picks up again. But those would be an interpretation of this graph. The graph itself represents tens of thousands of data points. And if I was going to reproduce this in a textual way, I would probably have to give you, I don't know, a list of all the citations or a list of all the, the works in which um, Foucault is mentioned or discussed, and that would not be infinite, but it would be quite long, and much longer than this, which you can grasp in an instant. So this he takes as proof that visualization is a type of communication, but a very special type of communication. So with that in mind, um, we can sort of, I think, move into speech act theory and examine what's going on there and what are the closest correlates to an ethics of visualization there. Uh, speech act theory, in large part, comes from J.L. Austin in the 60s. Um, and he's reacting against a tradition um, in philosophy in which statements are taken to describe a state of affairs or to state facts. And he's worried that this, uh, this is a very limited view of language um, because these descriptions or these statements are always taken to be true or false and there's no wider view of what language is doing. Um, so he says, um, there are utterances such that the uttering of a sentence is um, or is a part of the doing of an action, which again would not normally just be described in ordinary language, just be described as or as just saying something. So there are cases where I may take an oath and I say, I promise to do this, or I may take a vow, or I may christen a ship. And those instances are cases where in saying something, I also do something because it's a very particular kind of performative act. I'm not only uttering some words, I'm also making a promise, um, or I'm making some kind of command, um, or I'm making some kind of explanation. Now this may seem quite obvious, you know, to sort of ordinary speakers, and if you think about how language works, that seems quite obvious, but this was not the tradition in philosophy, really, before Austin. Um, the Western tradition in philosophy, and certainly the analytic tradition, was that statements and sentences were always just descriptions or statements of fact, and everything else was regarded as sort of meaningless, actually, if not sort of outside of the realm of interest, um, because it wasn't in the business of being true or false. Um, he also says that in these cases, when we talk about utterances like making a promise or taking a vow, um, we don't say the utterance is false. If I, if, I, if I break my promise to you, we don't say my utterance was false. Um, we say rather that the act, the promise that was contained in that utterance is void or it was given in bad faith or it was not implemented or the like. So this is the sense in which he thinks sometimes saying something is also doing something. It's doing a particular kind of action. Um, and because it's a doing, it very clearly, I think, places it in, a, in an ethical framework, along with other doings, where we can talk about whether that was good or bad, or right or wrong, or what the value of that, that action or that doing was. The person who I think has carried this notion the furthest, and I actually think a little too far, is Paul Grice. Um, and he talks about the sense in which there's a shared understanding between speakers and listeners when we communicate with each other. So he says, our talk exchanges don't normally consist of a succession of disconnected remarks. They are characteristically, to some degree at least, cooperative efforts. Each participant recognizes in them to some extent a common purpose or a set of purposes or at least a mutually accepted direction. So in other words, I'm speaking to you now, you're listening, I'm not giving sort of a random series of words. We're engaging in a certain sort of practice the practice is you've come to hear a talk today, you, want, you uh, expect that I've sort of prepared my notes, that I've got an orderly sequence, that I'm gonna lead you through a coherent set of ideas, that's why you're sitting here quietly instead of talking to each other or talking back to me. Um, it, so in, in, you're taking this in good faith, right, that, 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 I'm, that I'm going to do this. Um, similarly, I'm offering these comments today in the respect that, uh, or with the understanding that you'll listen, um, you'll, you'll take them under consideration, um, Etc. So he's really pulling on the idea that we're engaged in a sort of mutual understanding or a mutual practice here. Um, and he talks about this in four, he calls this the cooperative principle, that we're engaged in a cooperative act of communication here. And he says that this principle can sort of be permuted in four different ways. Um, and he describes these even as maxims, which is also Kant's language for describing uh, rules of morality. So I think he's drawing a very close analogy here to rules of action and rules of language. He talks about rules of quantity, that you should make your contribution as, infor as informative as is required. 
um, but you should not make your contribution more informative than is required. Otherwise, you'd have something like information overload. So if you ask me what time of day it is, I'll say it's 1231. But I won't say it's 1231 and it's December 12th, 2012, and you know, describing this temperature. I won't go into the temperature of the room and all these other facts about the weather and where we are and the location. I only give you as much information as you need for that present purpose. Otherwise, it would overload you. He talks about rules of quality. Um, don't say what you believe to be false. Don't say that for which you lack evidence. In other words, only say that which you have reason to believe or what you could back up with a credible testimony or document or some other kind of evidence. Be relevant. And then he's got this very interesting maxim of manner um, that you should avoid obscurity, that you should avoid ambiguity, you should be brief, um, and that you should be orderly in your comments. So he's, re and he actually thinks all communication should follow these rules, not just the kind that, that I'm talking about here, but all communication he thinks should follow these, uh, these rules. And I think you can sort of see how there's a parallel between some of these points here and some of the earlier points I was making about good design and visualization. If you go back to sort of some of the Manuel Lima stuff, where he says, uh, let's see, some of these are, um, don't glorify aesthetics, right? So don't include more, don't have it overly sort of hyped up. Um, just be orderly, be brief, um, try to be as clear as possible. When he says, um, don't um, visualize things that you don't have evidence for, it's very related to the maximum of quality here. So I think some of these guidelines are getting us close um, to what we would look for in an ethics of visualization. Um, but why don't I think that this account ultimately works? Well, I think Grice just assumes that language is normative in the first place. He just assumes that there are these rules and that there is this order to it. And he never gives us a reason, a reason for thinking that it should be that way or that we should follow these rules. So if you read a little bit past the quote I had, um, where he talks about the cooperative act of, of speaking, he says, we might then formulate a rough general principle which participants will be expected to observe. Well, why? Why will you be expected to observe this in communication? Um, that kind of answer is exactly the kind of answer that we're searching for here, in, in, that we're searching for with an ethics. We're looking for the groundwork. We're looking for an explanation of why we should, do, we should do it this way as opposed to this way. Why this system or this visualization is better than this one. And unless we have some sort of more grounding answer than just do it. Um, it's Grice or someone else giving us a command, but it's a command that we could accept or reject. It's not, it's not a reasonable command. It's not a, a demand that appeals to our, our own sense of rationality or to our own desires or to our own interests or to our own self-interest. Um, there's another reason why I think um, this account is, is not really going to work with visualization. And that's that Grice is thinking about face-to-face -face communication for the most part. And he's thinking really about speech acts and utterances. But if you think about visualization, um, most of what's going on with visualization is happening in a distributed sense. I'm speaking to I don't know whom. I put out a visualization and who knows who's seeing it. Maybe hundreds or thousands of people, many of whom I don't even know or have never met um, or never will meet. And also there's an asynchronous element to it. I can publish a visualization and you can pick it up 40 years later. Um, so it's not the same type of situation, it's not the same context that Grice really has in mind when he's talking about speech acts. Those work well in sort of face-to-face, -face, um, up close and personal communication where we may know each other or at least we're in the same environment with each other and we can be said to be in a cooperative activity. But the type of activity that we're engaging with, with giving and receiving visualizations is really a very distributed one, it's very asynchronous, it's very different from these face-to-face -face kind of encounters. So I think while the principles that he gives us may be useful, and certainly visualizers may find them useful in making visualizations, I don't think it answers our deep questions about what is the ethics of visualization and what's the grounding of that? How do we explain why some are better or worse or how they should be used? So moving on now to the second approach, which is role-based morality, um, I think that this has really gotten started um, as an academic field in the 70s with applied ethics. Uh, there was a little murmur of it before that. I think Searle in 1964 was one of the first to, to put this forward. He says it's often a matter of fact that one has certain obligations, commitments, rights, and responsibilities, um, and it's a matter of institutional fact. That is, by belonging to a certain organization or a certain institution, i.e., being in a certain role, usually professional role, 
you incur certain obligations, commitments, rights, and responsibilities. Um, and this has certainly been developed quite a bit in biomedical ethics, uh, health ethics, um, environmental ethics, governmental ethics, and other kind of professions where we might want to talk about certain kind of professionals or people in a certain role, doctors, nurses, etc., as having a, a particular kind of, um, of obligation. Certainly it's also discussed in the world of business ethics um, as, as businesses having a, a wider responsibility to shareholders or stockholders or a community or whatever variant of that theory you like. Um, but there's a recognition that institutions play a large role in this. Uh, Ruth Chadwick, in giving a, a definition of professional ethics, um, says that we can talk about the term profession in many different senses. Um, in one sense, it just means someone's occupation, what job they do. In another sense, it refers to uh, the kind of activity that one carries out, a particular status that one has. So a doctor or a nurse or even a professor has a certain status that carries with it certain professional obligations. Traditionally, she points out that professions have been marked by a certain body of knowledge and that mastery of that knowledge um, is regulated through degrees or credentials to enter into that profession. Um, and that many of these professions also have the ideal of service as part of them, as service to some larger group or some larger community. And I think the last part of this is very important. Um, in all of these professions, she says, we recognize that this body of knowledge has the potential to confer power, money, and status. Um, and be because it has the potential to do this, professionals are expected to use their skills and to use their knowledge for the benefit of the community. So this is the sense in which she thinks there's an institutional fact here. Given facts about the power, money, and status that people have, she thinks they incur certain obligations to be responsible with those powers, monies, and statuses, and to really use them to benefit the community. If we start thinking about what role or what profession is going to be closest to visualization, um, I think journalism is probably the, the, the best one to start looking into. Um, certainly many journalists are using visualization, and the ideas of you know, communicating knowledge to the masses, um, of representing information, of interpreting it, reporting on it, et cetera, is very close also to the ideals of journalism. So when we look a bit into um, journalism ethics, um, here are some of the questions that, that are now considered to be foundational questions in journalism ethics. And as we go through them, we'll, you know, we have to think a little bit about how does this or does it not or does it apply to visualization. Um, Daniel Ward says um, there are seven questions that really come up with journalism ethics. One concerns accuracy and verification. Um, you know, is the story really based on good data? Um, I think that this is probably the same as the Hippocratic Oath we saw earlier for visualization. Do no harm. Don't visualize things that you know to be false or you don't have good reason to believe. So that principle works. But in terms of the other ones, I think it's a little less clear. Um, so Ward talks about independence and allegiances. Can journalism, journalists be independent um, from their employers, editors, advertisers, sources, police, et cetera? Um, are there cases where journalists are too close to the source? Maybe you have cases of sort of like activist journalism or embedded journalism where they may be too close, too close to or actually participating in the source and you think that that compromises their objectivity? There's issues about um, deception and fabrication. Can the journalist not disclose that they're a journalist to get information? Um, can journalists uh, compose characters to conceal the identities of people they interview? Um, there's issues with graphic images and, manipula and image manipulation. Um, when can journalists publish gr uh, graphic or gruesome images? Um, when do these images just amount to sensationalism or exploitation? Um, how can images be altered or photoshopped um, in, in these contexts? Some of the other questions involve sources and confidentiality. Should journalists always um, disclose their sources or can they go off the record to get some information that's important? Are there special situations where reporting on a story might actually lead to more of that? Um, like if, if there are cases of sort of mass shootings, which there's a question of whether reporting on that actually causes more instances of that in some cases. Um, and then ethics across media types, uh, do the norms of sort of print and broadcast journalism apply to, um, to the internet? Does it apply to citizen journalism? Now, I think that these um, don't map perfectly well into the visualization environment. Um, they really do come from a set of concerns that arise out of the journalistic community. Uh, and it seems to me that many of these are simply too narrow. 
In other words, they're only concerned with accuracy or they're concerned with things like media type, print, broadcast versus online, um, that don't seem to me to be quite as applicable to visualization. So I think we might find some clues to, in to terms of what to look for here, but it's not going to be um, sort of the end of the story here. Um, moreover, I'm worried about the fact that people occupy multiple of these roles at any given time, um, and that the overlappingness of the roles or the many occupations that we play um, can often come into conflict. Um, and it's going to be impossible to, set, to settle those conflicts if you just use role morality, because this role will say do this, and this role, role will say do that, and there's really no way to set a priority there. You need some outside or some external criteria to come in and do that. Um, certainly a lot of visualizations are produced by freelance workers. Um, they're not sort of, the visualizers are not always in, embedded in really you know, clear and strict social institutions like journalists, and journalists less so as well now, uh, too, of course. So I think that the, the sort of ambiguity of roles, the overlappingness of roles can cause a problem here. And I don't think it's as clear that there's really a field that's defined for visualization. Um, visualization happens all over the place. Um, it happens in lots of different institutions in, for lots of different purposes. And it doesn't have the same kind of credentialing. It doesn't have the same kind of um, even necessary body of knowledge uh, that, that some of these other professions have. So I think you'll find that role morality gets outpaced here when we're starting to look at this, this newer field of, of visualization, which is really operating in a, in a global environment and an online environment that's quite different from some of these traditional structures. So that leads us to our third approach, which is to look at more general ethical frameworks for understanding how to give an ethics a visualization. The way that this usually works in applied ethics um, is that you take one or more of these normative frameworks, these large scale uh, views of ethics, and then you apply it to particular questions in a given domain. Now the point of this is not um, what many sort of freshman 101 moral issues students think. Um, many people, I think, leave that class thinking, oh, I could think this, or I could think this, or this. I don't know. Nobody knows the answer. You know, anything goes. Um, that's really not the point of, or that's really not the way that applied ethicists work. Um, the point of examining questions from these multiple viewpoints is really to develop higher level questions or higher level topics that everyone in the field agrees are important, even though they may take different stances on that. So if you look at something like the history of biomedical ethics, you'll see that, yes, there are Kantians and utilitarians fighting back and forth all the time, but from that discussion, um, we see certain topics like confidentiality or patients' rights. Um, and those are broad topics that everyone agrees are important, and everyone agrees we need an answer or we need to handle those issues somehow, though we may disagree on exactly how to handle them. So I think the point of, of doing this sort of exercise is really to come up with this broader field level questions, kind of the same things I just talked about with journalism, but to do it for th this environment, for this, this visual environment. So I started thinking about what, what kind of account would I want to ground an ethics of visualization in, though I think you could do it in many of these, but where would I want to go to this? And I came back to a thought that I usually come back to at this point. Um, funny story about this slide, actually. I posted it, and it originally said Marx was right. And a colleague of mine said, no, Marx is right. And I said, quite right, let me, let me adjust that and, 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 show, and show the edit on this. Um, now, if I'm going to give sort of a Marxist framework for understanding the ethics of visualization, let me be quite clear what pieces of Marx I want to, I want to draw from to do this. Um, so I think there, there are three parts that, and also I'll say many, many sort of ethicists working in the analytic tradition don't even believe Marx has an ethical theory there. They think he's got a political theory or a social theory or something else. They actually don't even think that you can get an ethics out of it. But I think there is a lot of potential there. Um, and the, the three pieces that I really wish to draw on are first, the historical framework that Marx gives us. Uh, Marx doesn't sort of think capitalism comes out of nowhere or the current power structure comes out of nowhere. He has a certain historical story to tell about how that developed. In fact, he has a long historical story to tell um, all the way back before capitalism. And, talking, and he talks at various points about um, the, the way in which uh, resources have been owned over the course of human history and how that has led to different social arrangements. Secondly, um, I want to draw on his materialism. I don't mean 17th century cosmology or, or, or metaphysics here. Um, I don't mean atoms in the void, although that may be relevant as well. Um, but Marx is really focused, I think, on material things and material processes. Um, he wants to be able, I think, to document cases of exploitation and cases of abuse and cases of power. 
Um, and he says repeatedly throughout many of his writings that he's looking for a pure science. This phrase comes up again and again and again. And I think many social scientists have been baffled by this because they think this is soft science, it's not hard science. But I think what he really means by, hard, by, by pure science is he wants empirical documentation to back up his theory. He's not just telling you a story about this, he really wants to be able to find evidence for, what he's, for the, the things he's talking about. And part of the whole point of his theory is, I think, awareness raising and consciousness raising, and his tr strategy for doing that is to present evidence for it. Finally, um, I think the, the real punch comes from his analysis of power relations. Um, of course, for him, this involves sort of a class struggle of, of various kinds, um, and we can talk about who holds power, who doesn't hold power, and the relation between those two classes. These three things are not new or unique by any extent in the history of ethics, or even contemporary ethics. I do think Marx is a bit unique in connecting them in a certain way, and that saying by attending to the history of these material re relations and processes, we then get an analysis of power. I think that's one of his more unique contributions. But these three ideas are not really sort of so crazy or so out there. Um, and to show that, I wanted to um, draw from uh, some of his opponents, actually, who do agree with him on these points. Uh, so first up is Robert Nozick, um, who's one of the leading, leading uh, philosophers of libertarianism. Um, and of course, he hates the communist state um, because he thinks the communist state is taking away people's hard-earned things and redistributing it to people who don't earn it. Um, but there's a very interesting passage in the book where he talks about, um, he he's also distinguishes himself from Rawls. Those of you familiar with Rawls or with the welfare state, um, he's, he's concerned about the government taking away or taxing people and then redistributing that, those resources to others. And he says Rawls' theory is um, really what he calls a current time slice theory. You just look at the present, this one time slice, and you see who's well off and who's not well off, and if there's a certain baseline, and whether you're above or below it, and if not, you redistribute to get up to a baseline. And if, it's, if it's, you're not there yet, you do it again, and you do it again and again and again until you get to some ideal outcome. Um, Nozick is very critical of this current time slice view, and in discussing it, he raises some Marxist points. He says most people don't accept current time slice principles. They don't accept Rawls as constituting the whole story about justice. One traditional socialist view is that workers are entitled to the product and full fruits of their labor. They have earned it. A distribution is unjust if it does not give the workers what they are entitled to. Such sentiments are based upon some past history. The socialist, rightly, in my view, holds on to the notions of earning, producing, entitlement, desert, and so forth, and he rejects current time slice principles that look only to the structure of the resulting set of holdings. Now, Nozick wants to take this in a very different direction and say, look, if you've you know, worked and earned your money, you get to keep it, end of story. Um, he doesn't have much of an account or much of a way of remedying past injustices here um, or, or remedying cases of past exploitation, but he certainly is on board with the historical principle, and he thinks many common people and many ethicists are also on board with historical principles. What about the materialism? Um, in Sex and Social Justice, Martha Nussbaum takes up the question uh, in her second chapter, should feminists be sort of liberals or should they be Marxists? What strategy is better for advancing global feminism? And she's very critical of Marxist forms of feminism. She thinks that they're too focused on the collective. They're too focused on how a group of people are doing as opposed to how each member of that group is doing, each individual. So she embraces liberalism and, and really a, a, a law tradition of human rights to argue for the worth of each individual person. And in doing that, she gives this rather nice passage. She says, liberalism responds sharply to the basic fact that each person has a course from birth to death that is not precisely the same as that of any other person, that each person is one and not more than one, that each feels pains in his or her own body, that the food given to A does not arrive in the stomach of B. The separateness of persons is a basic fact of human life. In stressing it, liberalism stresses something experimentally true and fundamentally important. It asks us to concern ourselves with the distribution of resources and opportunities in a certain way, namely with concern to see how well each and every one of them is doing, seeing each and every one of them as an end worthy of concern. So I think actually this is 
quite in line with Marx himself in thinking about an empirical documentation of exploitation and abuses. And when Marx says, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, he literally says each. He is literally concerned with the extent to which each member of society can contribute to society. And he's concerned with each member of society getting back from society what they need. So I think Nussbaum's really just wrong in thinking about uh, Marx's view as collectivism. State capitalism may work that way, but I think Marx, strictly speaking himself, does not hold this sort of view that we're just worried about the group. I think he is, at the same time, also intimately worried about each individual person, and his materialism and his sort of empiricism and documentation of that is also relevant. Finally, on the analysis of power relations, I don't think that Rousseau, this is Rousseau's discourse on inequality, I certainly don't think Rousseau is an enemy of Marx. I think Marx actually inherited much of his, his views from Rousseau. Um, but Rousseau just has this passage that's so beautiful and really gives a, a long history um, of looking at um, high-level cases of exploitation or high-level power relations. In the discourse on inequality, when he's talking about the founding of laws, um, he says the people all ran to chain themselves in the belief that they secured their liberty by establishing law. Those most capable of anticipating the abuses were precisely those who counted on profiting from them. Such was or should have been the origin of society and laws, which gave new fetters to the weak and new forces to the rich, irretrievably destroyed natural liberty, established forever the law of property and of inequality, char uh, changed adroit usurpation into an irrevocable right, and for the profit of a few ambitious men, henceforth subjected the entire human race to labor, servitude, and misery. Not the rosiest passage in philosophy, but one where Rousseau, I think, is trying to critique a deep power structure that he sees in society that's enshrined in law. And it's exactly the same kind of critique that Marx is giving in looking at a base of economic relationships and property and talking about the superstructure of law, ideology, um, culture that lies on top of that to support that. Now, just to conclude, um, a reminder I'm taking, again, these three points from Marx and thinking about how can we apply this kind of view into a visualization framework. I think at minimum we'd be interested in um, where does visualization come from? What's the history of it? Um, who developed it? For what purpose? What historical purposes has it been put towards? In a materialist framework, we'll be looking for, I think, the effects of that visualization. Has it been used rhetorically in certain ways to make public arguments, to sway the public in certain ways? How can we document that? How can we find cases of that? Also, how can we monitor that in the present? Or how can we create visualizations in the present to model or map um, what we may see as current abuses or current cases of exploitation? And then again, all of this will give us a, a rich discussion of power. I think in the end, um, this gives us both a way of looking at visualization as a process in which power is implemented um, and power can be controlled and channeled. It's also a product of power. It's also a, an artifact that's produced and power can be read through it. And I think we'll find, um, at least at the present, I think we can talk about three kinds of rights or three kinds of questions that emerge from this. One is what I'm calling rights of visualization. And we might just ask this sort of like access to visualization. Who produces these visualizations? For what purpose? Who has the resources to produce them? Not everyone can just produce this. It requires a certain literacy. It requires a certain technology. Who has access to the visualizations? Who has the literacy? Who has the technology to even receive them? And are there rights to access? And we can graph this sort of onto discussions about literacy and access to technology in general. Secondly, I think we'll definitely be concerned with rights in visualization. Are there rights to accuracy? Are there rights to certain levels of information quality, um, to clarity, to good design? Are there rights against having information overload? And this is the sort of discussion that I see as really relevant for professionals in the field who want to know how to design good or ethical visualizations. Um, how will they follow these? How, how will they understand rights in visualization? And finally, I think we can also very interestingly talk about rights to visualization. And we can ask, do certain groups that have maybe gone unnoticed or gone suppressed, or certain issues that have gone undiscussed, do those maybe take priority in visualization? We know that governments, we know that businesses, we know that the powerful can produce visualizations and do produce visualizations all the time. Just think about the number of statistics and graphs that were thrown at us in the last election cycle. That actually might be the, I, I don't even know how to quantify that, but if you, if you think we're to look historically over, over election discussion, um, numbers and statistics like jobs, deficits, 
um, are really uh, becoming the forefront of that discussion. It's really becoming a rhetoric in which people can move. But a concern there is, uh, again, some people have more ability to produce that data than others. Um, so are there priority rights to those who maybe don't have um, that ability? To what extent are those rights? And how would one best implement those rights? Should it be done by giving education and tools to people to represent it themselves in a sort of hacker ethic, that, hacker ethic, that kind of notion? Or um, is it okay for others to come in and visualize on behalf of other people? Could we talk about um, visual imperialism or data colonialism or things like that? And what are the concerns that might arise there? So I think we're, we're just sort of cracking into these notions. I think archival theory has, and special collections have real interests here as well in terms of documents and what to do with documents that they have. Um, and I think somehow we're going to need to, as we move forward with visualization, um, we'll need to wrestle with something in the neighborhood of these questions um, in terms of asking who has access to the visualization, um, how best to produce them in ways that people can use them, and are there sort of neglected or really priority audiences that we need to look at. So this is all emerging work. Um, I think there's a, a sort of rich histories and other fields to draw on here, um, but this is at least the way I'm thinking of the question, and I really invite um, more comments and more feedback from you all. Thank you very much. Everyone's puzzled. <laughs> um, I have a question about what you said uh, when you're talking about how role-based ethics weren't sufficient to answer somebody's question. You sort of took a moment to say that in the field of journalism, the concerns are too narrow, as we cited, you know, the concern about media types is obviously racist. But you also suggested that the concern over accuracy is too narrow. I was really surprised by that. I saw that as what journalism has in common for a lot of other professions. And what makes journalism special is the time constraints they have. Like, you know, journalists have to produce something, it may not be true, but it has to be accurate enough to be published in a very short amount of time and requires some very sophisticated, sometimes ethical thinking and, and good and bad advice. So it's not accuracy that's the main concern of the visualization. I think it may be the main concern. It's not the only concern. Um, nor do I think it's the only concern of journalism. But I, I think I'm really responding to the idea of that Hippocratic Oath there, that that's the end of the story. I take this vow that I do no harm with visualization, and then I'm done. Um, that seems to me, it may be necessary, but it's not sufficient for an ethics. Um, my other concern about using journalism ethics is really that most of that is grounded in a theory of journalism as the fourth estate, um, and journalism as a check and a monitoring of government, and its role in the public sphere. And because of that, I think it's really bound up in a state, nation state based theory. Um, and I, I'm not aware of, th there may be some work in sort of global journalism and, and, and global um, type of concerns, but I, I haven't seen that in the journalism ethics literature yet. It's still at the level of nation states. Um, I think that that's a, a model that's becoming more and more outdated. Um, and I think that visualization, in many cases, goes far beyond that into a global context. So if we can update journalism ethics in a global way, it may address some of the, so, the same concerns. And I would really, if, if data is becoming a medium, I would like to see us sort of, you know, eventually sort of merging these two or getting the discussions closer and closer together. I was interested that you went to journalism instead of some early graphic design. So I'm wondering how the ethics of graphic design fit into this as sort of very clear, you know, already established profession. There have a lot of the professionalistic sort of guidelines and ethics, I think, for the people. So I'm wondering how that fits in discussion. Can you point me to some of those resources? I'm unaware of that. You know, I don't know exactly what. Okay. I, I guess I'm thinking in terms of um, your discussion of disciplinary identity and things like that as a way of informing those professional standards. But, I don't know how qualified they are from an ethics standpoint, but right. I know that if you talk to graphic designers, they're going to say, these are the basic principles by which we design. So I think that's an area I definitely have to look more into. And I would like to see some of the, if, they, if those documents do exist. My only slight concern is that I feel like the field of graphic design, and even now journalism, is more porous than something like medicine or business. Um, in those, you have a, a, a very, you have titles, you have degrees, 
you have a community that has a community agreement, as it were, or a code of ethics. And it's very well developed because the field is very clearly bounded. My own, I mean, I kind of do graphic design. Does that count? Do I, do I call myself a graphic designer? I don't know. Um, what's the degrees? You know, I, I, it, see, it strikes me as more porous. And I have a guess that because it's more porous, it doesn't have as codified of a professional standard or an ethics. But I'd be very interested to see what, what has been said about that um, and to see how to take that into, um, into some of this work. I, mean, I think the other part of that, though, is whether the people who are entering those fields Without, without this sort of degree granting training, whether they're receiving any of those principles and tenets from the field, or whether they're establishing their own their assumptions, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have one more thing that Isn't the design, there's a book which I made, I don't know, but it's, it's called, I think Design is a Profession, and it's published by Alyssa Park. And it's very much, it's just one book by one person, but it's very much about design has done properly, has certain ethical practices in relation to client, and it's a process, it's not an outcome. Mm -hmm. And professional designers nowadays can respond to that ferocity or try to use it to distinguish themselves from people who just know how to use a computer and make something look like this. If you follow this process, then it is design. And I also want to mention one other porous kind of field which I'm not very familiar with, and there was a lot of activity in the 60s, 70s, 80s, which is in international development, the phrase participatory research, mm -hmm. which is where people are uh, researching development problems, typically asking questions and deriving information from communities that have very, very low amounts of power. Mm -hmm. And, and there's very, it can be very, very destructive, and the concept of participatory research arose to kind of deal, or at least be aware of those power disruptions and find ways to do that properly. And I see that a lot especially in terms of large-scale data collection for information visualization, has some of the same implications. Absolutely. I think there are two concepts that are a big help um, here. One is the concept of ethological validity, which comes from ethnography and sociology, really. It's where an ethnographer is able to create a concept of a social space that the community itself endorses and recognizes as this is right. Um, I think that that's a very relevant issue here for visualization. Um, and the second issue is countermapping. There's been a lot of research countermapping. There's been a lot of research in the past 10 or 15 years on countermapping, which is where you sort of throw out the geopolitical boundaries that we normally have on a map, and you just ask people to map their communities, ask where they can get fresh food in their communities, or how they navigate through their communities. Um, and it, it, you get different, very different results there about how people think of their own worlds and how they navigate place and space in their own, in their own environments. Um, and I think that that kind of work can definitely lend itself to this sort of ethical discussion. Um, so yeah, thank you for bringing up the idea of participatory research and, and more, um, more, more active research with, with the, the, the research subjects themselves, yeah. There's also elements, uh, there's a lot of research ethics that could be drawn into this, right? You can talk about vulnerable populations, right? And the same things you talk about with, with drug trials um, and things like that could, I think, also be brought into, you know, are we mining data out of these people? Um, and, and exploiting, there's a discussion of uh, data as the new big oil, right? And, and sort of mining this as a resource out of people. And I think that that's a definite discussion we need to bring in here as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, well sir, and, and that was one other thing that I wanted to ask you about. Toward the end of your comments, I don't know if it was what you meant to say or something like that, but you started talking about the production of data and the production of visualization. Yeah. And those are Two, different. two very different things, and I'm wondering what relationship you see between the producers of data, per se, and the producers of the visualizations. I'm coming from science, and so you know, historically it's been, if I'm going to publish on my data, I also need to visualize that as a way to communicate. So there's a very close sort of correlation between those two things, but we're getting to a point now where people can hold another piece of data, Absolutely. where they can, you know, either generate their own data without some of those data producing ethics of it as well. And so I guess I'm wondering how those two speak to each other at the same time. I view it as really a co-constitutive process. So often when you start it, when you have a, you want to visualize something, right? Um, it's usually not just I get some data and then I visualize it. You usually have to massage the data or collect the data or merge it with other data sets to get the insight that you want. And I think at least 80% of the work that goes into a visualization is usually on the data end, 
to be quite honest. Um, I think that they inform each other. You may have a data set that you can see you can get some results out of, but you also have some questions that make you go back and get new data or refine that data or do something else. So I think that they're very intimately linked. And if we're going to talk about, I, I do wrestle with this question about, am I talking about ethics of visualization or ethics of data or ethics of technology or, but they're all related. And I, we can try to tease them out quite finely, but I'm not sure that that's beneficial. Maybe visualization, because it combines data and design, because it combines uh, technology and communication, maybe because it's at the center of all these things, it can just be its own case study, as it were, that has all these roots and has all these lenses um, and actually advances these other fields um, and advances our thinking on these other fields. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm a little bit unsure what to say about you know, how, to, how to cut up that field, um, but I think it, there are connections and it's just a, it's an interdisciplinary field to begin with and I'm not sure it can be cut up too cleanly. Chris, you mentioned um, the data visualization and the election, and I wondered if there were particular examples that you could point to um, for, let's say, unethical framework of, of data, or if you think that you know, it had any impact on the election. Oodles. Um, <laughs> even better, there's a, um, um, a Tumblr called Senate Charts, or something like United States Senate Charts. Um, I, I can send you the link, or I can tweet the link after this. Um, but it's, it's wonderful. They just have all of the images of charts that are presented on the floor of the Senate. Um, and, I mean, many of them are very, the, the, the one that I showed at the beginning from is actually quite, you know, it's, it's based in numbers somewhere. But a lot of the ones are just, like, cartoons. Um, but they're held up as evidence, literally held up as evidence. People marshal them onto the floor of, you know, our highest legislative office. So I, I think that there are plenty of examples of this. Um, and... I, wonder, I worry that we're almost oversaturated with, with it to the point where we may distrust visualizations in a political context immediately. That's not a bad thing. I would just like it to be a healthy skepticism as opposed to a paralyzing skepticism. And then I guess also how, as, how, how do I interpret the data so I can, you know, when I see a visualization, how, is there a checklist I can use to see if, it, if it's ethical? Yeah, um, I think there, there can be certain design things, right? Like make sure your scales are appropriate in a certain way. Make sure you list the source of the information. Um, if possible, provide a link back to the data set. Um, don't include data points that don't exist. Sometimes, you know, in Excel, if you're missing, if you're drawing like a year, a year to year trend and you're missing a particular value, it just papers right over that and makes it look like there's data there. If you, if you use synthetic data, that's also, sometimes with census data, for example, they won't give you, you know, real records, but they create synthetic records of fictional people that are based on statistically reliable samples. Um, if it's synthetic data or if it's an imputed value represented as such, make sure you clearly differentiate that from hard data. Um, also, I think being transparent about the narrative of the visualization is very important. Usually when you're creating a good visualization, you have a story that you want to communicate. If you choose to highlight this particular point, or if you include a filter feature, there, it's there for a reason because you're trying to get across a certain body of information or a certain viewpoint to an audience. I think if we look at the text that's often accompanied with a visualization, it should be transparent in terms of what, um, what's really going on. And I, I do think that examples like this um, are really problematic. I mean, why, why are we calling this a mountain of debt? Um, it's not a mountain of debt. It's, regardless of, of whether this is even true or not, it's 20% more than where we are now. It's not a mountain. It's a hill. It may be an important hill, but it's, you know what I mean? It, it's some of the language we use here strikes me as it frames it in a, in a, in a cliff. Like, why, why, why are we using this language of catastrophe and this language of disaster? I think those kind of very charged semantics don't help bring out the data in the visualization at all. So that was a quick list of stuff off the top of my head. Maybe you could give that back to me now. Yeah. Um, Chris, you mentioned education at one point, and I wonder if you could explore intersections with visual literacy or other kinds of um, yeah. kind of educational or, or competencies. I'm not sure exactly what you look at, but ways to address what, what Brian was just asking. Yeah. There is some exclusivity here, right? If you have, say, a blind population, this 
automatically excludes them from this kind of, of information. You could give them a narrative of the visualization, but it's not the visualization itself. On the other hand, I think there's certainly, I haven't researched this enough, but I, you know, there are visual learners and there are people who understand things visually much better than they can understand if you give them data. They freak out with numbers, but you show them a graph and they're fine. So I think it, it can be empowering and disempowering at the same time. The question is to whom and in what proportion. Um, and I'm just not up enough on the, the, the research on, on a sort of visual literacy to know that, but I think that's actually something that, that's relevant here. A question about the, your, your process of, of coming up with this and thinking through this. Uh, have you found yourself going down avenues that you never thought you would? To, to oh, yeah. This combines all my old stuff with all my new stuff. And, like, <laughs> that's actually kind of how the idea came about. I think it's just, so my, my PhD is, is really in the foundation of ethics. Um, and now I'm working much, much, much more in, in information visualization. But I think when you start looking at these examples, like, um, well, the island's been in, in my course. Like, so, so, several of these are ones that I use in class all the time when we talk about the history of visualization. And when you look through these, you immediately say, there's a lot at stake here. And as an ethicist, anywhere there's stuff at stake, I'm, you know, it's, it's on my radar, and I'm worried, and I'm questioning what, what approach can we give to that. Um, I'm you know, a, a little disappointed that there hasn't been much work on this, and I worry that this has become such a popular medium now. It's become so popularized in the press and everywhere. And we have no I think on the one hand, it's you'd expect that applied ethicists would jump into this, right? But applied ethicists, um, there aren't many tracts there. There's a biomedical tract, there's a business tract, there's an environmental tract in applied ethics. And then you've got some fringe, the fringe being journalism, um, computer ethics, and so forth, uh, information ethics, information privacy, that kind of stuff. But I don't think that, I think that those fields are rather constrained along those tracks, and it hasn't been broken into. We don't have a lot, we don't have it going into a lot of domains. But how about the economics? Isn't there some economics ethicists who are looking at things like that? There may be. If there are, Point them. If you know of them, send them my way. I want to talk to them. Um, there may be. And I think, I think there's a, a sort of a low-level awareness that we should be skeptical of visualizations or at least examine them or that they're used for certain purposes. But I haven't seen anyone giving a more systematic account of that. Again, you really, you would look for sort of something that has legs in the history of ethics, something that can graft onto that long discussion. Um, and I haven't seen anything quite like that. A lot of it is from the end, the, sort of a technocratic end or a technological end, right? How do I optimize this visualization a little bit more? How do I make it clearer? Um, but that's really not pausing to reflect on the general phenomenon of visualization and what the, what the stakes are there. But yeah, I need to, and I'm not, also not sure it would even be discussed as ethics, right? I mean, I'm not even sure what, what word you would use to search for it. It might be something like responsibility or um, misleading, right? You might find more examples on the negative end of bad, of bad visualization. Um, but again, it tends to be, I think, more case-based rather than a, a systematic account. So I, I think you're right that I, I do need to certainly scour some of these other fields for examples from there. Um, I think that those can inform a more general account, though, which would help. OK, thank you.